Okay, hello everyone. Um, I think we can start. Uh, there might be a few people that are going to run a little bit late, but I think we can um, add them as we go along just because of uh, our interest in time. I think it's wise that we um, start this event. Uh, so uh, my name is Philip Petkovsky and I'm a PhD candidate uh, in culture and performance at UCLA. Uh, and I'm doing research uh, on dance as cultural heritage. I think I'm probably the newest uh, member of ASAC and this is my first event uh, with this lovely organization. So I'm very um, excited. Uh, the first thing that I would like to, uh, to mention and is that this meeting is being recorded and they will be posted on YouTube. So if you object to this, I would advise that you maybe, you know, turn off your cameras and uh, so you can stay anonymous or just uh, let us know. Uh, uh, before uh, we begin, I just wanted to say a few words uh, about our event today. Um, excuse me, I'm, my computer froze. Can you see me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and then uh, we will have uh, Carlota and Manon who will do a uh, few presentations. Um, so ASAC Talks are basically an interactive face-to-face uh, event that provides a platform for sharing knowledge among students and young professionals working within uh, the cultural heritage studies. So in this first uh, ASAC uh, talk, we are inspired by the work of Europa Nostra as the leading citizens movement to protect uh, and to celebrate Europe's cultural and natural heritage. So we will be exploring um, young perspectives uh, on the topics related to civic involvement uh, and democratic participation in heritage matters, uh, you know, such as the citizens' role in the preservation of heritage, youth participation, uh, participatory management strategies, and people-centered um, approaches to heritage. So today we have uh, four presenters, uh, which I am going to introduce in a bit, but I, I would first uh, uh, invite Carlota to do a short introduction about ASAC. Carlota. Hello, um, my name is Carlota and I am as part of the coordination committee of ESAC with Philip, and I'm going to share a few slides about our organization. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so ESAC is a youth-led network of students and young professionals working in cultural heritage. And our goal is to increase collaboration between, um, between young people and with other uh, heritage professionals. We're based on collaboration, which means we are a team of volunteers uh, and we just try to find like-minded people to create exciting projects like the talks that we are seeing today. Our structure is made of individual members, which are students, uh, recent graduates, young professionals, PhD students, uh, with an interest in cultural heritage. We're not defined by a particular field. At the same time, we have working groups in different cities and universities, and they're sort of like our representation on a local level. And then we have a coordination committee, which is selected every year, and that we kind of um, coordinate all the different activities of the network. We have different activities, like the SAC Talks, which we are launching today, we also organize a physical meeting every year. Um, it, this year, of course, it had to be canceled because of COVID, but we have postponed it for hopefully next year. And so we hope uh, we can have a big meeting with uh, conferences and presentations by all the different members. And we also uh, have presentations, um, publications of one book that was already published, and then there's a new one called Advancing Interdisciplinary Cultural Heritage Studies, and it will be coming out in a few weeks. Um, that's all for me. Uh, I just want to welcome you to ESSAC. If you are not already a part of us, I invite you to join us. Uh, it's really easier than ordering a pizza. So you should uh, get onto our website and fill out a form and become an, a member of, um, of our community. And I also wanted to say, if you go to the Evan Bryant page, you will find a link to our website and also to a survey that where you can provide feedback on this event afterwards so we can continue to improve um, in the following um, events that we do. And also you can choose the topics for the next talks. Um, and that's that's all for me. Thank you very much, Carlota. Uh, now I will invite uh, Manon to also say a few words. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. 
I'm very happy to participate in uh, such an important webinar uh, for the younger generation today. I'm also looking forward to hearing the other presentations, which are focusing on very different topics, but they're all very important uh, for the resilience of the heritage sector. Uh, in addition to thanking, I also want to congratulate the organizers, ISAC, our cooperation already started when your organization was born two years ago on the occasion of the European Year of Cultural Heritage and your participation to our summit in Berlin. And we are delighted to continue our partnership for the benefit of the young generation. So today I would like to briefly introduce Europa Nostra for those who might not know our organization then to show the power of cultural heritage for the future of Europe and why it is so important for the young generation to be involved in heritage matters. So our organization was born in 1963 in Paris, some uh, 55 years ago. It has its headquarters in The Hague in the Netherlands and a smaller office in Brussels, where I'm now based after having spent five years in our office in The Hague. We are the European Voice of Civil Society committed to cultural heritage. So we represent a large citizens movement, a network of more than 1000 individuals and 350 organizations from all kinds. They can be small local organizations, but also large foundations. We amplify their voices and facilitate their networking across Europe. We celebrate excellence in the heritage field with our flagship program, the European Heritage Awards, Europa Nostra Awards, that we give every year together with the European Commission in four categories, conservation, research, dedicated service, and education. But on the other side, we also campaign to save uh, the most endangered sites in Europe especially through the seven most endangered program run in partnership with the European Investment Bank Institute. And our fourth pillar of activity, which I want to uh, develop a bit further, we are advocating for heritage towards policymakers at all levels of governance, it can be local, regional, national, European, and also on the global scale. And in our narrative towards policymakers, we highlight that cultural heritage is a strategic resource for Europe's economy, society, culture, and the environment. Together with the European Heritage Alliance, we have issued this year the manifesto, Cultural Heritage, a powerful catalyst for the future of Europe. I will share uh, the link to the document with you in the chat after uh, the talk. So in this document, we list seven of the ways how cultural heritage can act as a positive agent of change towards some uh, pressing issues that Europe is facing. Why? Because cultural heritage contributes to our well-being, it embraces our values, our diversity, it advances the digital shift, it provides solutions to fight climate change, promotes sustainable cultural tourism, and many more. So in this way, Cultural heritage contributes to building more positive, sustainable, inclusive, and cohesive societies in Europe. And this is why heritage concerns all of us. It is who we are, our identity, it surrounds us, and it is key to our future. It is therefore only natural that citizens and civil society participate in heritage matters. It's an act of democracy. But there is also an urgent need to strengthen the voices of young people. We are often referred to as the future generation, but we are not the future. We are the present and we are actively engaged uh, professionals and students in the heritage world. At Europa Nostra, youth has been one of our main priorities for the past two years. We've introduced in 2019 a free membership for young people under 30. Our aim is to provide them with networking and capacity building opportunities, but also to get inspiration from their creativity and fresh ideas. And since then, over 130 talented young people have joined our network. And we are doing our best to encourage their participation in the heritage debate, 
in particular by inviting them to contribute to our work and events and therefore ensure better representativity of the heritage community. But in return, there's also a need to empower youth by providing them with the right tools. For example, last year in Athens, together with Erfrut Brabant, we've organized successful capacity building days with 60 young heritage professionals from 20 countries across Europe and beyond. It was organized in conjunction with our council and board meetings to stimulate intergenerational exchanges between young and less young heritage experts as a mutually beneficial process. Because we can learn a lot, but we also have a lot to offer in terms of innovation or digital skills. And this is a process that we want to continue in the future. So to conclude, I would like to highlight that being involved in cultural heritage means crafting the future of Europe. It's our duty and responsibility to build a more sustainable and inclusive future. We can speak up and be engaged in the upcoming conference on the future of Europe, which should include so-called youth agoras, is a great opportunity for us to mobilize and pass our messages across. We can do this together. So join Europa Nostra and join ISAC today. Thank you for your attention. Um, I will be happy to answer any question you might have either later or via the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manon, for the lovely presentation. Yes, if you do have questions, uh, I would say that maybe let's, uh, you know, save them for, for the, uh, by the end of this event. Uh, so we are going to now uh, continue with our presenters. Uh, and first, uh, we have um, our first presenter is Goran Djurjevic. Uh, he's a PhD student at the Department of Archaeology, uh, Capital Normal University in Beijing, China, who is going to present uh, on the research student group called uh, Mirror Studies. So Goran, you have five minutes and then I will um, message you in the chat box once you have finished your four minutes so you can wrap up your presentation. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, can you just add me as host so I can share? Right. Screen. Yes, Manon, can you? There we go. Oh, thank you. I hope that you that you see my presentation. Uh, it's a great honor to participate today here and I hope that it will be interesting and wonderful talks for colleagues. So um, my topic is introduction to mirror studies project and this is the project uh, very young started just two years ago and it started by a group of four students from the archaeology GIS and history who were at this time at the Capital Normal University in Beijing in China and this is our logo and we started the project with several aims that include that we would like to establish web application that will bring online databases about the mirrors object made for reflect reflection and these databases will be made as uh, online historical sources archaeological and cultural heritage list of publications museum collections and uh, other things and we also want to improve the idea of mirror studies as interdisciplinary academic field by making digital online conferences and making other educational materials. As you can see, our database is very simple to research and it is divided by uh, different uh, cultures or civilizations like Rome, Greece, etc. and different symbols that include uh, the, the, the various shapes and the colors. And it is very easy to see uh, number of mirrors and the spatial distribution of mirrors. The similar is for museum collections, as we have uh, example here. So the da database is ongoing project, but you can see how is it uh, established and it is user participation project. So we are very open for the, the colleagues and young professionals and students and scholars uh, for all around the world, especially from Europe to participate. And this is open access project. This is based by the documents of the digital heritage by UNESCO and others. 
and also to re-establish the international conference, which is virtual every year in March, to establish main academic network be between the students and professionals who are researching mirrors in their interdisciplinary field. And this conference is without fees, so it is ve very good. Uh, for future tasks, we, we would like to improve, of course, historical sources and the bibliography and the educational materials as well, which means the workshop for the students and the pupils from the various age that teachers can make in their schools. And also we established the online library where, it, where it will be PDFs of the various um, books and the papers about the mirrors from the, the various disciplines and the video dictionary where the famous scholars uh, have their own presentations about the mirrors. And this is on the YouTube. So our goal is to establish mirror studies in the global research area and in the academic network. And we are very open for cooperation. Please visit our website, www.mirrorstudies.com. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Goran. Um, if you have any questions for Goran, make sure you write them down and then you will post them uh, once all of the presenters uh, do their presentations. Uh, next, um, we have uh, the next presenter is Munire Nurgul Buyugulu from the Department of Architecture at Istanbul Technical University. So Munire is going to present uh, on the role, role of rural communities uh, and heritage preservation in uh, Jumalizik village. Uh, Munire, please. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. So hello everyone. I'm really glad to be here today and I will present the rural rural communities and heritage preservation in Somalia. So I'm going to Okay. Um, I am also here as a representative and, uh, and the heritage researcher of Heritage for All Initiative. And before moving on, I would like to mention the initiative. Um, it was founded in April 2017. It mainly focuses on heritage, conservation, museology, and site management, sharing up-to-date aspects with young, young professionals within its virtual platform, as well as capacity building activities. Um, interpreting our logo and slogan, these activities are open, open to people from all educational backgrounds and age groups. In 2019, following the ECOMOS UNESCO World Heritage Center annual theme, Rural Landscapes, the initiative launched the International Online Internship Program, Rural Heritage and Traditional Foods, for six months. And through our page, you can review the achievements of interns who are from India, USA, Italy, China, Turkey, and Bangladesh. We would like to also acknowledge the uh, professional, professionals and organizations that supported the interns. So now to start with our topic, Jamal Kazik. Um, cultural landscapes show the area's characteristics, culture, and history in relation with nature. They are one of the most important elements of tourism, which allows rural areas to get the opportunity to show their culture by presenting their local identity with their tangible and intangible heritage. It is essential to pass on all the traditions and customs left from the past civilization. If so, how can this be achieved? The local people are the key to that, and the case of Jumala Kazakh represents the importance of citizens' role in terms of rural heritage preservation and promotion. Jumala Kazakh is a village in the east of Bursa, which was the first capital of the Ottoman Empire. The village was established with a unique urban planning system of Fatos, and the monuments in the village represented the early Ottoman period, having a great importance in architectural history. Apart from its architectural heritage, the traditions of trade and culture, continuation of the rural life, and the traditional shadow theater called Karagos and Hajivat made this village unique to be designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2014 with Bursa. Although the village had a lot of visitors, even before it, it was inscribed to the World Heritage List, the Turkish TV series called Kamilikar was taken in a house in Jamalukuzik and brought attention to the village. The visitors usually come to see the south and visit the village as a day trip in the weekends because it is close to major cities. Sorry. 
Um, Jumala Kazak is a great example of a preserved traditional Turkish village, which is one of the reasons why it has a high density of visitors. The houses have two to three floors. Their sub-levels were built by stone and upper floors are wooden, filled with adobe. All the streets are covered with natural stone and they each contain a drainage system. They do not cut each other and there is only enough width for people and horse-drawn carriages to pass from them, which is actually a way of opening the streets to tourism from the local people and visitors. The houses in the village allow a relationship between streets and people. The upper floors of the houses are for private uses only, but the ground floors are formed by the local production style and used as a public space with the interventions done by the residents to serve easier. So people get to see the locals making gözleme, which are Turkish pancakes. And they all try to sell their local products by inviting people into their houses to eat. Some say they have the best olive oil, some say they have the best raspberry jam. And there are also lot, lots of handmade products such as knitted shawls and accessories with the ornaments and colors of the Ottoman period and even flower tiaras. Also at the entrance of the village, there's a square which is used as a local bazaar where they sell their handmade goods and local products such as tarane, erişte, which is noodles, jam and herbs to the visitors of the village. And they still continue to farm and sell um, walnuts, chestnuts, raspberries and cherries as well. The village has an active and lively vibe because of the local people. Especially the women in the village have an important role in community involvement and awareness. An organization was established to help prepare activities and support the women in the village. With several projects, they have presented their traditional clothes and had a chance to be involved in the in tourism. Also, many traditions are still kept alive, like hijrales, wedding activities, birth and funeral ceremonies. And every year in June, there is a raspberry festival in the village where traditional dances and performances are held with competitions to find the best grown raspberries. And the whole village gathers around the main where to see these activities. Um, to sum it all up, even though uh, the village was built in the 14th century, it has preserved its historical texture with original materials and the dwellings stand against the chance of the risk of uh, losing their authenticity and identity in tourism development. In order to protect the village as it is, sustainability and rural tourism should be taken into consideration cautiously to prevent any loss of the built heritage. And due to Jumalika's active local community, both the built heritage and the cultural heritage have been kept alive. And they took the lead in turning the village into an open air museum, which can be considered as a way of conservation and promoted their village. And this was the end of my presentation. I'm very glad to be here and have the chance to present. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mira, for your presentation. Um, next, um, we have uh, our next presenter, Kaya Iyer, uh, who is an independent dance researcher and a graduate from the Corimundus program, which is International Master of Dance Knowledge Practice and Heritage. Uh, Kaya is going to present uh, on the heritage sensitive intellectual property and marketing strategies in the project. Kaya? Hello everyone, good evening, bonjour, namaskar. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, all right. So from Turkey, now I'm going to take you to India. So greetings, uh, I'm in Paris currently and my name is Kavya. And I'm excited to talk to you about a project on ICS and communities through the lens of the HIPAMS India project. So HIPAMS basically stands for Heritage Sensitive uh, intellectual property and marketing strategies. Um, so just to give you an overview, I'm going to go through the project and the process and the how the co-creation was done with the communities. I'm going to give you examples of some tools which were developed and some feedback from the community. What were their experiences in the implementation of these strategies? So the project initially was started in the June in June of 2018 in West Bengal, which is in the east of India. And after consultation uh, with community members and the HIPAM team, which is a team of experts based in Europe, um, after many rounds of proposals and workshops, 
currently we are in the implementation phase so the selected strategies which were developed with the community members are still uh, being implemented so hypam basically celebrates local stewardship in a global market and it's based on three main ideas community engagement and ICH, commercialization of products for sustainable development, and intellectual property rights and marketing strategies. So what do we mean by this? So we're basically placing ourselves at the intersection of these three broad ideas. When we say uh, intangible cultural heritage management, we talk about it being done and managed by the communities and groups that practice and transmit it. Um, and where required, some solutions can be co-created with the help of experts. The second aspect is, of course, marketing or the commercialization of product, products created through ICH practice. Now, usually commercialization of ICH is seen as something which is profane, which, is, which, is, which should not happen. And often we talk about over-commercialization or over-touristification of ICH products. But we do not, we often uh, disregard under commercialization. What if the communities who, uh, who have this ICH themselves want to use it in order to make a living, in order to sustain themselves? So what we are looking at is this third, uh, third uh, column here, which is heritage sensitive commercialization. So how can commercialization happen while at the same time not uh, demeaning the heritage in any way? And the third category which we are focusing on is intellectual property rights, which is the use of things like geographical indicators, copyright, um, and, and, and such, uh, trademarks, uh, patents, etc., which can help in the safeguarding and marketing of these uh, ICH properties. So the three communities that we are working with uh, is the Patachitra community, the Purulia Chow community, and the Baul community. So the first is a community of artists or painters. The second is a community of dancers and mask makers. And the third is a community of singers. Um, so how does the process exactly work? So it's based on four uh, very simple steps, diagnosis, then the strategy development, the strategy implementation, followed by monitoring and evaluation. At each of these steps, uh, different questions are asked pertaining to the process. So how can artist communities most effectively promote and protect their reputation as custodians of ICH while also raising awareness about their art? How can they balance safeguarding and their heritage skills while also innovating in order to reach new markets? And how can they identify their commercial rights and gain more control over their work with regard to third party use? And these are some of the important questions that the project has been addressing, going from diagnosis to development to implementation to monitoring and back to diagnosis as a circular process. Um, and each step has been co-created with the communities, so their involvement has been absolutely essential uh, in each of these four steps. So it is the communities who define what heritage is important to them, and it is they who decide what they want to achieve. And each of these strategies have been co-created and co-developed with the communities along with local NGOs um, who exist in West Bengal. So I just want to give you uh, an example of one of the tools which was used, which is called the Roots and Fruits tool. So the roots basically denote the traditional skills, which is like the knowledge, the materials, the know-how, and the meaning that the communities have, where the fruits denote what can be done with this uh, knowledge and traditional skills. Do we want to stick to the traditional stuff which we have been doing, or is there something more that can be done, something more innovative? And this is something that the communities themselves have developed and decided. So one of the examples have been, for example, these high pam scrolls. Now, communities used to make these scrolls on very traditional uh, folk tales, etc., and they used to paint it on these long scrolls. But after going through this uh, project, they have also uh, used it to depict, for example, intellectual property rights, 
or the use of uh, copyrights, etc., and how these can help them. And the last example I want to give is, for example, reconceptualizing packaging, right? Because, for example, if you have a scroll and you just give it to a tourist in their hand, it's different from if you have it in a nice box or which has a geographical indication mark talking about where the product comes from, what is it used for, what are the, what are the materials that have been used in the product, etc. So just as a conclusion, these have been some of the early findings from the community who have found it very, very uh, important for them. Uh, the, their awareness about their rights, their skill to improve and negotiate with third parties, their use of digital tools such as Instagram, Facebook, social media, et cetera, have in, has improved. And they themselves have been able to use their traditional skills to educate other consumers and artists about heritage. Um, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya. And then uh, uh, finally, we have uh, Joao Victor Jarski, a graduate from Universidade Federal de Paraíba, who is going to present on how international habitation may enhance the protection of indigenous people's um, cultural heritage. The floor is yours. Um, okay, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on when you're at. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, so, uh, as kindly introduced, my name is Victor Jaski. I'm an attorney here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, I work mostly with international and national arbitration, but also with litigation and uh, commercial law. And first of all, I'd like to say that it is, it is a pleasure for me to be talking here about such an important uh, and interesting subject, which is the protection of the cultural her heritage. And in my case, specifically, the, the protection of uh, indigenous people. So uh, the issue that I have brought for this kind of conversation is how international arbitration may enhance the protection of indigenous people cultural heritage. So at first sight, uh, I'd like to apologize for not having a slide presentation, but I hope it would not cause any harm for your comp comprehension. Okay, so, but at, at first sight, it might seem really uh, contradictory to talk about uh, international arbitration in regards to the protection of cultural heritage. After all, arbitration is often more related to uh, commercial issues or investment disputes. And indeed, if we take, for example, uh, the investment arbitrations, if we take the bilateral investment treaties that exist, the more than 2,000 bilateral investment treaties, only a few of them uh, include clauses regarding uh, cultural heritage protection. So uh, one could say that uh, the inter interna uh, international arbitrators will not take into account cultural aspects when they render their decision or in their decision-making process. However, this is not what I have found uh, in my research. What I have found is that despite the arbitrator having, despite the fact that the arbitrator have limited jurisdiction, that is to say they are bound to a specific treaty or to a specific contract or to a specific agreement, they still take into account cultural aspects when they render their decision. And even beyond that, they do not only take into account uh, well-renowned or magnificent uh, cultural objects, such as, for example, the Eiffel Tower. The, no, uh, arbitrators really take it into account the cultural heritage of indigenous people, which is uh, fairly interesting. What I have also found is that the arbitrators use, usually base their decision on international, uh, on the principles of international law, but also on the soft law, but mostly on the 1972 UNESCO Convention, which is the World Heritage Convention. And I have brought uh, one specific leading case to show you how this tendency is working nowadays. And the case that I have brought is called the, the Glenis Gold versus United States case. It was an investment arbitration. The applicable treaty was the North America Free Trade Agreement. 
and the arbitration rules were the ANSI trial rules. Uh, long story short, this arbitration involved, involved an area of the Californian desert, which was considered sacred by the, um, by the Yuma people, which is an indigenous people here in that region. And um, uh, Glenis, they, this Yuma people had a ritual that in which they walked through in a specific path in that area. And uh, this area was considered uh, sacred because and this ritual was called the, the trail of dreams and glamis gold was a canadian based mining company and they were seeking to uh, construct a mining site in that uh, in that region however the construction was basically impeded by administrative impositions made by the state mining and geology board in california uh, this body uh, demanded the complete backfilling of the area and the complete restoration of the site. Basically, they required that the region would be in the same conditions that it would be before the construction of the mining. So the Glamis Gold initiated an investment arbitration and they requested compensation for uh, indirect ex expropriation. What is interesting about this case is that, is that Despite it, the fact that it is an investment arbitration, that is to say it is only a private company, which was the Glamis Gold Company, and a country, which was the United States, the Yuma people could join the procedure as amicus curia. And there was also non-governmental organizations in this procedure, such as the Friends of the Earth and Sierra Club and Earthworks. So after six years, the this arbitration was finally concluded and the claimant lost the arbitration and i'm not saying that the decision was entirely based on the fact that the human people should be should be protected that would be actually a mistake in, but it is really interesting to, uh, to take into account that the arbitral tribunal uh, dedicated a whole chapter in the arbitral award to explain and to analyze the impact that the construction of the site would have in the indigenous community cultural heritage. And it, it, is, it is even more interesting that, despite not being bound to it, the arbitral tribunal applied the 1972 UNESCO Convention and specifically Article 12, which uh, establishes that a country shall protect its cultural heritage, even if it is not listed in the, in the World Heritage Convention list. So uh, I'm not saying, uh, just to conclude, I'm not saying that international arbitration, uh, be it investment arbitration or commercial arbitration, is the perfect uh, grounds or the perfect element for protecting indigenous people's cultural heritage. Uh, even because international arbitration only, is only initiated after the conflict has uh, already begun, it would be more interesting to have uh, uh, rights or rules before the contract, the, the conflict arises, so that we could, uh, uh, it could be more clear what are the rights of those indigenous people. However, if we take into account that we have uh, more than 2,000 VITs in the world, it would take an enormous work to renegotiate all of those treaties, and that considered the fact that international arbitrators take into account cultural uh, issues and cultural elements when they rendered their decision is already a really significant step towards the protection of indigenous people cultural heritage. So I, I'm up for any questions and I thank you for, for attention. Thank you, Victor, very much. Uh, and thank you to all of the presenters. Um, we are going to proceed with, uh, with the discussion, so if you have any questions, uh, I would ask you if you can please um, uh, type your name in the chat box so I can call your name, uh, so we can keep a count of who posed what question. And I think we already have a question for uh, Goran uh, from Kavya, and she says, thank you for your presentation. Can you please tell us how you are involving uh, local communities in your project? And thank you for the question. Uh, this is a question for future. We will involve the local communities more at the moment. We are mostly focused on the students and the academia. And of course, some individuals who are uh, working with us or participating, but we will involve local communities in the three ways. The first way will, will be uh, 
uh, audio and video materials about their uh, retold stories to preserve it and put it as a cultural heritage about the mirrors and the reflection. The second part will be uh, education project and the presentation, especially for children, students, and, and the pupils. And the, the third part will, will be more uh, options for, for them to recreate and to be a user participation in our project. Thank you very much, Goran. Uh, then we have Carlota, who has a question for Kavia. Carlota? Um, hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, yeah, I was wondering how has um, COVID-19 affected the development of your project and the commercialization strategies in, uh, relating to the work of the artisans and so on? A great question, because that's, that's been a new addition to the project because of the impact of COVID-19. So actually, this has been a learning for the community because initially they were really not exposed to the, to the digital world at all. But in a way, COVID-19 kind of gave, forced them, but also gave them like this opportunity to explore the digital uh, aspects of everything. So they've started, um, like the NGO which works with them has started uh, introducing workshops for them where they learn how to market themselves also on Instagram, Facebook, host their own website, reach out to more people. And this is something that the, these communities had completely uh, no idea about uh, or did not know how to use. And uh, this project is currently focusing on this. And in fact, we're trying to develop a policy brief so that it can also be moved up one level to policymakers to say that, look, it's not enough if, um, I mean, if only the consumers have access to internet, but it is also the very communities who are working and who are producing these products who need to have access and training to use internet in order to do this. So uh, that's how they've been learning to cope with COVID-19. We're still getting there. Thanks, yes. great question. Thank you, Kavya. Um, any other questions? Okay, we have a question for Goran. Um, what software did you use for creating the map? Uh, and then uh, do the presenters have some uh, research gate or academia accounts where we could read more about their research? Maybe Goran first, what software did you use for creating the map? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use WebGIS and we, we also uh, have used QGIS, so we, we, we combine them, but I think that WebGIS is better. Um, although, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert for GIS. Our colleagues who are studying this, they are doing with the maps. And then we connect it with our um, database, which is made um, very simple in the Excel data, in the Excel document. Thank you. And then I suggest that if you do have academia or ResearchGate accounts, maybe if you can post them in the chat box, so, uh, or if you can send them to Zuska, um, so we can read more about your research. Um, any other questions? I have another question. Yeah. Um, it's for Munir. Um, how does the perception of the city as a cultural landscape affect its understanding or its working or the way you approach its study versus it being just a city? How does the, this, this idea of the cultural landscape change your approach? Um, maybe um, because the area is a cultural landscape, but um, we, the rural communities have um, a bit of a approach on more tourism. So it's not perceived as a cultural landscape to the visitors and to the local people maybe, but um, for the academia, it is perceived as a cultural landscape. And we um, and when it, it was inscribed to the World Heritage Site, as a World Heritage Site, um, the, the properties and the um, the cultural landscape was taking into consideration, but um, 
what what I told you today was more about the um, rural communities and the um, involvement, like the civic involvement. So. Thank you, Murira. Um, I think we're coming almost close to an end of our event, but before we wrap up, um, I would like to invite Jetske, uh, who is also going to have a short presentation. But if you do have any other questions that you can think of, please, by all means, post them in the chat box or address them uh, you know, personally to, to our presenters. Um, so let's go now with Jetske. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, thanks for all the interesting presentations and the discussion. Um, ASAC invited me to tell something about myself and about the new partnership between ASAC and the European Heritage Tribune. My name is Jetske. I'm from the Netherlands and I'm 27 years old. Since um, I studied human geography, and specialized in cultural heritage and since 2016 i work for a dutch news platform on cultural heritage um, it's called the erfgoed stem which translates to the voice of heritage um, following this dutch example uh, my colleagues and i um, started a European news platform during the European Year of Cultural Heritage in 2018. And this European news platform, the European Heritage Tribune, was officially launched um, one year ago during a um, European Nostra event in Paris. And as you can read, the European Heritage Tribune um, shares the latest heritage news from all European countries. And we also share best practices, events, calls, um, research and reports. And by doing so, we aim to connect, uh, inform and inspire cultural heritage professionals from Europe and beyond. Um, to give you an example of the heritage news we share on our website and in our newsletter, I collected uh, some news headlines on cultural heritage and COVID-19. So as you can see, um, in May we posted, um, uh, we wrote about um, the UNESCO platform on living heritage and COVID-19. And uh, in September, we wrote about the Historic England Fund um, to help historic high streets to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. So these are just some examples. Um, but as a young heritage professional myself, um, I believe it's very important to make your voices heard too. And that's why I'm very excited to announce that um, the European Heritage Tribune and ASAG will launch a blog this week. And the blog posts will be written by ASAG members and will be posted on the European Heritage Tribune website. Uh, for example, today's speakers will write a blog about their presentations. And if you would like to contribute to this blog, um, please feel free to contact me or ASAC. And um, well, we will make your voice heard. I would like to end my presentation by inviting you to visit our website, heritagetribune.eu, and to subscribe to our free and independent newsletter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jetske. Um, thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you to our partners. Um, I think our event is coming to an end. 
before we uh, wrap up, I would uh, uh, ask you if you, if we can take a group photo that is group screen photo, I guess, a screenshot, uh, so we can uh, you know use it uh, for our website. Uh, so please stay for that. And once again, uh, thank you, thank you to all uh, and for your participation. So let me now figure out how to do this. Okay. All right, if we are ready, I can take the photo. Ready? One, two, three. Perfect. Okay, thank you everyone. And then see you on the next ASAC talks. Bye-bye.